this situation and has unveiled an ambitious new master plan to better integrate lower income areas with parks, transportation hubs, and jobs. Like much of the world, Brazil has a growing gap between its wealthiest citizens and everyone else. The top 1% of Sao Paulo city residents owns 45% of the property. The master plan addresses this by mandating that private property owners who underutilize valuable city space need to either meet scheduled deadlines for putting that space to better use or pay a progressively costly urban property tax. The plan has been praised internationally, but the real challenge will be overcoming the powers that be to make sure it is carried out. This brings us to Sao Paulo's third major problem, citywide traffic jams that steal tens of millions of productive minutes every day. In the last decade, the population increased 11%, but the number of cars grew 113%, 10 times as fast. Congestion is so bad that wealthy Palestinos are flocking to the air, and the city now has the world's largest helicopter fleet. The ability of the wealthy and powerful to avoid their city's problems by literally flying over them has contributed to a sense of complacency among the leaders of Brazilian society. Like many other nations, it is now reckoning with the damage caused by politicians who put personal greed over the best interests of the people. An example of this is a shiny new high-speed rail line connecting Sao Paulo and Rio that the federal government promised to build in its winning bids for both the 2014 World Cup and 2016 Olympics. But two years after the flame left Rio, the rail project hasn't even broken ground. Palestinos are fed up. Hundreds of thousands protested to demand solutions to the mobility crisis, forcing local officials to listen to people and integrate their best ideas into the master plan, like how best to expand the number of roads and metro lines, increase express bus routes, build networks of dedicated bike lanes, and concentrate housing near public transport hubs to maximize employment opportunities. Sao Paulo's most distressing challenge reached a critical point four years ago, when the region suffered the worst drought in its recorded history as just half the rain fell from the previous driest year. Without water to wash dishes, high-end restaurants served guests on plastic plates and cafes couldn't brew coffee. As panic set in, fighting erupted in the hardest hit neighborhoods and emergency water delivery trucks were robbed. As the city's main reservoir dropped below 5%, less than three weeks supply, the military feared the water control center could be overtaken by an angry mob. One service engineer remembered those terrifying days. We knew that when people don't have water, they go crazy. We imagined what they would be like here with 21 million people. In the end, a storm arrived just in time to avoid catastrophe. Since then, other sources throughout the region have been tapped to give Sao Paulo a bit more supply when the next apocalyptic drought arrives. But some experts are warning that even more extreme dry spells loom on the horizon. The vast South American jungle has traditionally served as a biotic pump, circulating water down from the tropics through rivers in the sky that converge over southeastern Brazil, delivering reliable rains year in and year out. But decades of logging and agriculture have gutted hundreds of millions of acres of dense, mature trees, and every second, another two acres disappear. With less plants and soil catching and absorbing rainfall, there is less moisture evaporating as clouds into the airstream, and ultimately, less rain falling on Sao Paulo. The lifeblood of this megalopolis has been the three or four convergence rainfalls that have arrived like clockwork every year to fill the region's reservoirs. But as the frequency of these events becomes less reliable, so do the future prospects of the entire city. The remarkable fact is that 20% of the world's water is stored in Brazil, but the vast majority of it falls far to the north. With its rivers currently too polluted to drink from and development continuing to spread inland, there are limited options for bolstering its water supply by building costly dams or acquiring new sources through long canals. In the end, the people of Sao Paulo, just like the rest of us, are learning the fundamental lesson of the 21st century. To survive and thrive, 
our cities must embrace the most sustainable methods of development. The good news is that, with a clever master plan and citizens dedicated to taking action, Sao Paulo is hard at work on the long-term solutions to deliver a better life for millions of people. The Sahara is home to the world's largest desert city. For centuries, this place has thrived alongside the world's longest river. The city of a thousand minarets is the capital of the Arab world, a megalopolis with a population of 20 million people. This is Cairo, Egypt, the megacity of the Middle East. Born on the east bank of the Nile 5,000 years ago, Cairo dates back to the time of the first Egyptian pharaohs and iconic pyramids of the ancient city of Memphis. Much later, in 641, the Arab general Amr Abin al-As founded the town of Al-Fustat, the seed from which contemporary Cairo has grown. In 970, a walled city was established to protect its inhabitants from conquering armies. Over the next 400 years, it would grow to become the largest city in all of Africa, Europe, and Asia Minor. With almost half a million people, it was a key link in the lucrative spice trade, allowing it to thrive culturally and intellectually. Some of the earliest institutions of higher learning were established here at this time. The middle of the 14th century saw Cairo reach the pinnacle of its importance. Soon after though, decline set in as plagues like the Black Death began killing large portions of its population. Then, its spice trade monopoly was broken when Vasco da Gama sailed from Portugal to India, establishing an alternative sea route, undermining Cairo's economic importance. And, while under Turkish control, Cairo was relegated to just another provincial capital within the massive Ottoman Empire. Fast forward to the 1830s, when the urban growth that defines modern Cairo began. Influenced by the renovation of Paris, a European-style city was built to the west of the medieval core. Cairo entered its most rapid period of expansion in the 1950s, triggered by Colonel Nasser's revolution that ended 2,000 years of imperial rule in Egypt. That's when the city began sprawling northward into the fertile Nile River Delta, consuming valuable farmland. This growth was fueled by improvements in transportation and industrialization. Things like flood control allowed the riverfront to be developed, and bridges allowed people to settle on the area's islands and west bank. Just like we've seen with the other cities in this series, Cairo's development eventually reached a point of critical mass where it suddenly became an attractive enough destination that people began arriving faster and faster and in larger and larger numbers. But unfortunately for Cairo, it was unprepared for this influx and couldn't grow fast enough to support them. Many of these newcomers had to make desperate choices about where to live. Today, half a million people live in the City of the Dead, among row after row of tombs. More of Cairo's poor live in a place called Garbage City. Here, 70,000 Kyrenes sort and recycle the 15,000 tons of trash that's created every day in the rest of the city. They actually provide a vital service and were even recognized as one of the most efficient sanitation operations in the whole world. An urban artist named El Said recently undertook a beautification project there and shared what he learned in a TED talk. The Zareb community was the ideal context to raise the topic of perception. We need to question our level of misconception and judgment we can have, you know, as a society upon communities based on their difference. The people of Cairo call them the Zabbalin, which means the people of the garbage. But ironically, the people of Manchiet Nasser call the people of Cairo the Zabbalin. They say they are the ones who produce the garbage, not them, you know? But even if you've got a home in Cairo, it's often built on shaky ground. Developers frequently ignore or bribe their way past rules that limit buildings to a height of six stories because of the oversaturated Nile River Delta land that serves as the city's foundation. This had tragic consequences in 1992 when an earthquake that collapsed numerous residential towers killed more than 600 people. Today, looking around Cairo from above also reveals that nearly all the rooftops are occupied by squatters who've made ramshackle homes on the only open space they could find. One of the ways the government dealt with overcrowding was to build a large subway system modeled after the Paris Metro. It now has one billion riders a year and has somewhat eased the brutal traffic congestion, but it brought the unintended consequence of encouraging even more people to move to the city. 
In response, the Egyptian government has tried to relocate people to gleaming new cities they are continually building on the outskirts of Cairo. But with bad transportation options to and from there, these cities become too expensive to move to and fall flat every time. 22 of these new towns already exist. Designed for millions and millions of residents, they collectively hold a little over 1 million. It seems the excitement and connectivity of urban Cairo will always be more attractive than a life lived in overpriced suburbs further out in the desert. But wealthy developers haven't gotten the message. They're driven by profit and prestige rather than doing what's best for Cairo. And Egyptian housing minister Mustafa Madbouli seems to be listening to them. He recently unveiled a $40 billion mega plan to build an entirely new capital east of the city. He argues the project is needed to ease congestion and overcrowding in Cairo. It attempts to follow in the footsteps of other purpose-built capitals we've seen like Islamabad, Brasilia, and Canberra. At 700 square kilometers, it will be as big as Singapore and will aim to house at least 5 million residents. The project was originally led by the Emirati businessman behind the Burj Khalifa, although disagreements forced the Egyptians to turn to Chinese companies instead. This ambitious, risky project has many Egyptians wondering if it's the right way forward. What new capital are they talking about? They should pay more attention to the poor and needy instead. Millions of Egyptians are unemployed and the government wants to spend billions of dollars on a new capital. The new capital city is a late decision. Here in Egypt, I don't know, but those in charge only start thinking after the problem has already happened. Perhaps one of the reasons President el-Sisi is initiating the project has to do with what Cairo has just lived through. In 2011, the world was captivated by the Egyptian revolution when millions took to the street demanding change. First, the 29-year rule of Hosni Mubarak ended. Then, the misguided and brief presidency of Mohamed Morsi was toppled by a coup led by the current president, El Sisi. With a firm grip on power, it makes sense for El Sisi to want to build himself a new capital safely removed from the masses in Cairo, a city that is now home to nearly one in four Egyptians and is one of the fastest growing places in the world. In the next 30 years, its population is on pace to hit 40 million. One of the factors that's bringing so many people is climate change. While Cairo is removed from the coast, the Egyptian city of Alexandria isn't, and it's already feeling the effects of rising seas. NPR's Jane Araf recently traveled there to tell the story. Egypt is one of the country's most vulnerable to climate change. Eventually, entire neighborhoods could be underwater. The Nile Delta is crucial to Egypt. More than half of its crops are grown in that triangle where the Nile spreads out and drains into the sea. In farmland along the Nile, diesel pumps bring up water from the river for irrigation. Increasingly, seawater is creeping in. A coastline that is continually creeping inland will force more and more people to move to Cairo. This will amplify the pressure Cairo's leaders already feel. But solutions exist to manage its growth. As long as smart ideas prevail and Egypt's precious resources, be they land, water, or money, are used in the most efficient way. In a documentary that's several decades old now, visionary environmental consultant Munir Niamatala made the case that Despite its size, Cairo can thrive. Mega cities really are an opportunity. They're not a burden. We have to look at mega cities as a place where human beings are going to efficiently contribute something to mankind. The world now is not separated by national boundaries and cannot be separated by national boundaries. Thank goodness, and that is very much because of megacities. Megacities are playing a very, very, very important role in promoting peaceful coexistence and in making sure that the very important issues that concern our planet, such as environment, are indeed exchanged, attended to, and acted upon. What makes this place unique? It is the world's largest city at an elevation higher than 2,000 meters. With 21.2 million residents, it rivals New York City for the title of largest metropolis in the Americas, and it is one of the world's oldest continuously populated urban areas. But what truly sets this megalopolis apart is also its biggest challenge, 
It is the largest city on Earth without direct access to a significant body of water, although that wasn't always the case. This is an examination of Mexico City and the water crisis that threatens its continued prosperity. Nearly seven centuries ago now, the Aztecs came across an island in the middle of a lake in a vast valley more than 2,000 meters above sea level, hundreds of kilometers from the nearest coast. 300 years later, a small group of Spanish explorers led by Hernán Cortés arrived and what they found was a thriving capital city, the heartbeat of the Aztec Empire with 300,000 souls. It was called Tenochtitlan and it amazed the Europeans. Its labyrinth of canals dividing a network of man-made islands reminded them of Venice, and they wanted it for themselves. There in the center of the lake was this gleaming white city. It was something they had never seen before, and for us we could almost imagine as Dorothy looking at, the, uh, you know, at Oz for the first time. It was far larger at uh, a quarter of a million people than any city they had ever seen in Europe. Armed with superior weaponry and the most powerful exterminating agent, disease, the Europeans wiped the Aztecs out and systematically dismantled their great temples and pyramids. Then they set out to quickly build the most renowned city in the Americas. They rejected the Aztec way of living harmoniously with the land and instead filled their canals, destroyed their floating farms, and drained water from the lake until it was completely empty. This set the city on a collision course with nature. Over time, it has grown to cover the entire lake bed and well beyond, and because two volcanoes, one of them still active, loom over the city from the south, the soil is a mix of clay from the lake and volcanic rock. That's an unusual foundation to build a sprawling, heavy, concrete jungle on, and it's why the city is sinking. But people keep on arriving, because the defining feature of Mexico City is centralism, the idea that all paths lead here. What used to be trails converging on grassy highlands became dirt roads used by carts and donkeys loaded with goods and are now the arterial roads that move millions. The explosion of Mexico City's population, like other megalopolises around the world, follows the widespread adoption of the motor vehicle. In 1950, its population was 3.1 million. As paved highways became more common, it jumped to 5.5 million by 1960 then nearly tripled to 14 million inhabitants by 1980. This boom has exacerbated the city's two most urgent challenges, bringing in enough water for 21 million people, while simultaneously sending away the millions of liters of wastewater they produce each day. The city is failing on both fronts. Now, it's worth noting that crime is not Mexico City's most pressing concern. It can be a dangerous place, but the reality is that while the country has seen its murder rate rise as drug cartels battle for territory, the federal district has some of the lowest crime rates in Mexico. It has installed more than 22,000 surveillance cameras throughout its 16 boroughs and put thousands more police officers on the street. Increased security keeps violent crime in check and creates opportunities for educated and artistically inclined young people from the surrounding states. It's a young, vibrant place with an economy that accounts for one quarter of the country's GDP while holding more than one fifth of its population, that's one of the highest capital to national ratios in the world. Centralism, remember? Its neighborhoods are diverse and flow endlessly into one another. One minute it feels like you're in Paris, turn the corner and it's Manhattan, but just a few streets over lie the rundown avenidas of Tijuana. Above all though, it's crowded. Mexico City is the most congested place in the world. Although it has an excellent 12-line metro system that's cheap enough for anyone to ride, its 5 million cars snarl the roadways on the streets above. Which brings us back to the water crisis. The city experiences a powerful 1-2 combination that amplifies the intense droughts and downpours that come with climate change. A gigantic concrete slab situated at the bottom of a valley surrounded by mountains that block in its pollution. It's a heat sink that speeds up evaporation while preventing rainwater from entering the water table below. So the city had been counting on its Grand Canal to expel 280 cubic meters of wastewater a second from its overflowing sewers. But it relies on gravity to pull the water away. As the city sinks, the canal becomes less and less effective. Today it works at just 30% of capacity. The ever-shifting ground also means that many of the 8,000 miles of pipes delivering drinking water leak 
resulting in the devastating loss of up to 40% of what's originally pumped up from freshwater sources many miles away. And that's just the situation for the residents lucky enough to have a constant supply. 20% or more of Mexico City residents can't even count on water flowing from their taps every day. This has created an incredibly inefficient system where fleets of trucks fill up their tanks and drive to deliver to customers by hose, house by house. That's an expensive way to live, and it's why many low-income families have to spend 10% of their monthly income for just 10 gallons of water per person per day. In Iztapalapa, there are a thousand trucks distributing water to two million people, which is nowhere near enough to meet the needs of those people. It's expensive, inefficient, and customers like Sylvester Fernandez, a struggling cab driver, are not satisfied. Sometimes it takes one or up to five days after we request it. And sometimes we can't buy other things, like diapers for the baby, because we have to pay for water. Meanwhile, residents living in the wealthy neighborhoods consume 100 gallons on average a day from their free-flowing taps and pay just one-tenth the price. This rampant inequality amplifies the destabilizing effects of climate change, and water-starved communities like these exist all over the world, which is exactly why the U.S. Pentagon calls climate change a threat multiplier. The director of Mexico City's water system explains what a severe drought could mean. Quote, We're facing a potential disaster. There is no way we can provide enough trucks of water to deal with that scenario. There is a serious possibility of unrest. One study says up to 10% of Mexico's population could eventually head north if droughts and floods get out of control. The recent migrant crisis in Europe underlines how difficult it is to stop hundreds of thousands of people who are fleeing for their lives from crossing borders, seas, and yes, even fences and walls. To help solve problems like this, Mexico City's local government is gaining more power to govern itself. It clearly needs it. The deeply unpopular president, Peña Nieto, has simultaneously cut off funding for Mexico City's water fixes, even as he advocates for a multi-billion dollar new mega airport in a part of the city, a dry lake bed, that could make the water problem worse. There's no easy solution to this ongoing problem. But Mexico City has no shortage of smart people eager to get the job done. One of the longer term solutions could be the widespread adoption of rainwater harvesting that's being tried in some states. Rainwater harvesting is actually quite a simple thing. What we do is the, the rainwater that falls on the roof of a house, we channel it to a cistern and we pass through a, a very simple process that first flushes the water and filters it. Why are we pumping water from over here when we're having water falling on us from the sky for free in huge abundance. We just haven't known up until now how to take advantage of that. Every urban center has its monuments, its history, its skyline. But great cities are more than buildings. Great cities have a pulse. And few megacities capture the complexity, chaos, and vitality of a living system more vividly than New York. Yet, for a place so deeply embedded in American culture, its fascinating origins often go overlooked. After all, no city becomes the celebrity's playground, the city that never sleeps, the melting pot, the mother of exiles, and the American dream overnight. While it is no longer the largest metropolis on Earth, it is still the most influential. But as this fast-paced, capitalist mecca matures, it's confronting a unique set of challenges. Let's take a bite out of the Big Apple, America's megacity. One of the most remarkable things about this concrete jungle is how quickly it sprouted up. Compared to the other two megacities we've profiled so far, New York is relatively young. Less than 400 years ago, the city looked like this. In 1609, the island of Manhattan was found by an expedition. Its leader, Henry Hudson, realized immediately that it was a geographical gem, the ideal location to build a city. A large river ran along its entire western shore, and on its eastern edge was a narrow estuary connected to a large bay. Its southern tip was flanked by two more large bays and dozens of islands, including the much larger Long Island, which shields Manhattan from ocean storms. And as we saw in our previous explorations of Mexico City and Bangladesh, containing and distributing clean water to residents is often a keystone challenge for dense urban centers. On this front, however, New York City reaps the benefits of nature. Direct contact with water ensures reliable access, 
while elevated terrain spares it from excessive flooding. But back to the 17th century. After word reached Europe that Hudson had discovered what he called as pleasant a land as one can tread upon, the mercantilist-minded Dutch sent 30 families to build a settlement called New Amsterdam. In exchange for some metal kettles, axes, and cloth, the Native Americans who hunted throughout the area gave the Dutch the island. Slaves were immediately brought in to begin building the town. The town's population reached 700 in 1664, but it still wasn't receiving very much support from the crown back in Holland, so English King Charles II swooped in and, with four warships, captured the town without resistance. He then gave the colony to his brother, the Duke of York, and you can guess what they called it. By the end of the 18th century, New York had become an important port city. Then came the revolution that changed everything. In 1776, New York joined the other American colonies and declared independence from the English. After getting kicked out of Boston, the British responded by sending an entire fleet of redcoats to seize and occupy New York, which they held for seven years until George Washington led his victorious rebel army back into the city. After the war, New York briefly served as the capital of the newly formed United States until the federal government moved to the more centrally located District of Columbia. It's fascinating how that came about. The decision was ultimately up to President Washington, but he left it up to his two right-hand men to figure out. In a backroom deal, brokered by James Madison over dinner, Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton of New York agreed to allow the nation's capital to move south to Northern Virginia, the home state of Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson. In exchange, Jefferson agreed to support Hamilton's financial plan, which included the creation of a powerful central bank. Soon after, the New York Stock Exchange was established, laying the groundwork for Lower Manhattan to become the financial capital of the world. Today, it's home to the two largest stock exchanges by total market capitalization. A couple more events in the early 1800s helped accelerate the city's growth. A grid pattern of streets was laid out, providing an organized plan of expansion to the north, and the opening of the Erie Canal in 1825. This increased New York's importance as an export center of goods, agricultural products, and raw materials that could now be easily transported from the resource-rich Great Lakes region. Around this time, the city became the gateway to America, as large numbers of German and Irish immigrants arrived. Between 1820 and 1850, New York's population quadrupled. Many of these newcomers had to settle in tenement houses without proper sanitation or clean water. Diseases like cholera, typhoid, and smallpox became rampant. The construction of the Croton Aqueduct, one of the world's first great modern water distribution systems, helped to solve this problem and hygiene began to immediately improve. In order to preserve the fast-growing city's connection to the environment, a 600-acre area of swampland and squatter's shacks was set aside for preservation and eventually transformed into Central Park. Today, it's the most visited urban park in the country. Heading into the 1860s, slavery was deeply dividing the northern and southern states. New York was the epicenter of the abolition movement, when the Civil War began in 1861, after Abraham Lincoln was elected president, a riot broke out as angry white mobs attacked blacks who they blamed for low wages and the war. Hundreds were killed. Despite the unrest, the city's economic engine roared as it became the vital source of financing and supplies for the two million soldier strong Union war effort. After the Northern victory brought peace to the country, New York's industrialists were free to focus on building. In 1883, the Brooklyn Bridge was completed, linking New York to the third largest city in the country. The 1880s also brought electricity to the city, and by 1893, there were 1,500 arc lamps illuminating New York streets. In 1898, the state legislature incorporated Manhattan and the surrounding four boroughs of Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx, and Staten Island into the city of New York instantly doubling its population and quadrupling its land area. After leading the earlier fight to abolish slavery, New York was now the leader of the women's suffrage and workers' rights movements. This culture of inclusivity also welcomed African Americans, fleeing the destruction and segregation of the South. They largely settled in an area on the Upper West Side that became known as Harlem, the cultural capital of Black America. Electricity made the city the center of nightlife in the Roaring Twenties. By the end of the decade, the New York metropolitan area's population had grown to 8 million, passing London to become the planet's largest urban area. 
In 1931, the city also had the world's tallest building as the Empire State Building rose to dominate the skyline in an almost ridiculous way. World War II brought another wave of immigrants fleeing the chaos and destruction in Europe. When it was over, New York's status as the unofficial capital of the world was cemented with the construction of the gleaming United Nations complex along the East River. Throughout its history, New York has also been a core force behind major social movements that have focused the country's vision while unifying New Yorkers as a community with a common identity. The city played an important role in the civil rights movement of the 1960s, as leaders like Dr. Martin Luther King rallied support through the New York-based news media. The gay rights movement counts Greenwich Village as its epicenter. This neighborhood was also the site of a crucial battle between the powerful developer Robert Moses and residents led by activist and author Jane Jacobs. Their grassroots movement ultimately blocked Moses from carrying out a project that would have bulldozed the village and the area now known as Soho in order to cut through the heart of Manhattan with a giant expressway. Hades, economic problems, and the crack cocaine epidemic created a spike in crime, but modernized police strategies and the rebirth of Wall Street helped solve these challenges. Today, there are less than 400 murders a year in the city, down from a high of over 2,000 in 1990. Of course, New York still lives with the traumatic memory of its worst day, September 11, 2001, when more than 2,500 civilians and first responders died in the tragic attack on the World Trade Center. In the 16 years since, one World Trade Center has risen from the ashes to become the tallest building in the Western Hemisphere. Today, the New York metropolitan area has over 20 million residents. Just to be clear, the city of New York has about 8.5 million people, but for the purposes of this megacity series, I'm using entire metropolitan populations because that's a city's labor market, its economic zone, if you will. Anyway, New York no longer is the largest city or metropolitan area in the world, but its still massive population presents tremendous challenges. For one, its subway is one of the busiest transportation systems on Earth. Its ridership nearly doubled from 1 billion annual riders in the 1990s to 1.8 billion today, but the amount of track and subway cars has stayed the same. This crowding has bogged things down. The system-wide average on-time rate has dropped from 90% over the last decade to just 65%. The silver lining is that a $17 billion 2nd Avenue subway line is coming online. The first phase opened this year, but the remaining three phases could take more than two decades to complete. Another issue is exorbitantly expensive housing. Costs in some high-end areas have been driven up by foreign investors, like wealthy Russians and Chinese, who like to park their fortunes in the ultra-secure New York real estate market. But the root cause of high prices is simple supply and demand. Whenever a new housing development is built with affordable units, it gets 10 times as many applicants as there are units available to rent. The mega developments Essex Crossing Hunters Point South and Pacific Park that are going up throughout the city are seeing this firsthand. In the near term, the high end housing shortage will be eased, slightly, by the 28 acre Hudson Yards mega development. At an estimated total price tag of over $20 billion, this new neighborhood is the most expensive real estate project in American history. Another future mega project getting people's attention, for different reasons, is Cornell Tech on Roosevelt Island in the East River. The school joins the more than 120 colleges and universities in the city and will feature the world's first high-rise residential building that meets passive house energy efficient principles. Projects like these make it clear, New York City is cultivating the human capital needed to tackle the world's biggest problems. Thanks to climate change, New York will have its fair share. As we saw firsthand after Hurricane Sandy flooded large parts of the region, there is no bigger threat to New York City than rising seas. That storm caused nearly $20 billion in damages. With New York's coastline expected to be between 1 and 2 feet higher by 2050, now is the time to start planning for the future, whether that's designing flood and seawall solutions that blend with existing infrastructure, or embracing a policy known as managed retreat, where areas are simply abandoned in favor of higher ground. With so much at stake, there's little doubt New York City will meet these challenges. In many ways, it represents the best of our modern world. It's dynamic, creative, and socially tolerant. Its embrace of sustainability proves that 
capitalism and environmentalism are not incompatible, and its people, which speak 400 different languages and are 37% foreign-born, prove that, even in one of the most densely populated urban centers on the planet, if conditions are good, there's plenty of room for everyone to get along. Everest and the Himalayas It may not seem like this mountain range could shape a megacity almost 600 kilometers away, but it does. This place, the capital of the most densely populated major country in the world, is also the fastest growing city on the planet. This is an examination of Dhaka, Bangladesh. The constant supply of melting snow and water that flows down the Himalayas to the south creates the largest delta in the world. Much of it runs through Bangladesh, an agricultural paradise with some of the richest soil on the planet. But all that water is also a curse. With more than 700 rivers flowing into the Bay of Bengal, many of the country's residents become displaced when monsoon season arrives in mid-June every year. Annual rainfall in Bangladesh is over 78 inches, and two-thirds of the country's 64 districts experience regular flooding. Combine that with the highest population density of any major country, and you understand why Dhaka is adding more than 400,000 residents a year. If even a little of Bangladesh's precious land is overtaken by water, many of its people instantly become homeless. To top that off, when fields and villages flood, these already struggling microeconomies become even less sustainable. So people pour into the capital, because that's where the jobs are. More than 2 million people now work in Dhaka's many garment factories. That industry is the engine of the Bangladeshi economy, producing 80% of its exports. But it can be a hard industry to break into if you're a farmer coming from the countryside. So many unskilled people find work in the off-the-books economy. There's a reason why this is known as the rickshaw capital of the world. Cash gigs like vegetable salesman, barber, shopkeeper, boatman, and cycling cabbie make up nearly 4 out of 5 jobs here. Average pay for this full-time work is less than $100 a month. So development is a tough nut to crack. In order to raise revenue to provide better services and solve problems like traffic congestion, the city needs to bring these people out of the shadow economy. That idea was examined in the Global Post's excellent report on DACA from a few years ago. Legitimizing this vast slum economy would mean compelling millions of vegetable sellers, shop owners, barbers to get licenses, pay taxes, and formalize working conditions. It's a gargantuan task. DACA wasn't always so low in the global economic pecking order. In its heyday as the commercial capital of the Mughal Empire in the 17th century, it was one of the wealthiest and most prosperous cities on the planet. The Venice of the East, known then as Jahangir Nagar, was a worldwide hub of the cotton and silk trade. Its palatial caravansary, the Bara Katra, sheltered merchants traveling along the Grand Trunk Road, one of the oldest and longest thoroughfares in Asia. Then Dhaka fell into two centuries of turmoil that saw its status decline. First, the British took control in 1765. When they were forced out in the middle of the 20th century, the city became the capital of eastern Pakistan. Bangladesh finally won its independence in 1971, but only after suffering heavy damage during many battles. One of the legacies of two and a half centuries of power struggle in this region is its confusing and hard to define borders. The India-Bangladesh boundary is one of the strangest in the world. One look and it's obvious, Dhaka is taking in people from the entire region, Bangladeshi or not. This great migration is overwhelming the city's infrastructure and services, which simply can't keep up. Still, there are some obvious things the country should be doing to help Dhaka better manage its growth. One deceptively simple suggestion, put control over vital services in the hands of a single municipal government accountable to the people it serves. As in many unplanned cities of its size, Dhaka's police, utilities, and roadways are controlled by a dozen or more national authorities, mostly run by political appointees. Unfortunately, Bangladesh's political system is not functioning properly, especially at the national level. Dhaka's police force carries out extrajudicial killings, and the government tolerates and even encourages attacks on journalists, academics, and minority groups who try to expose mistreatment and corruption and the city has experienced an uptick in terrorism, and there's evidence some of its militant networks may be turning to the extremely violent tactics of the Islamic State or Boko Haram in Africa. 
and so there's a battle underway to attack foreigners. And this site was a site where lots of foreigners congregated, and the attackers knew that they would have foreigners as victims. That's why they attacked where they did. But, like many of the other underdeveloped megacities we'll profile in this series, the most pressing need Dhaka's citizens face is daily access to clean water. Many people live in slums, with limited water and limited money to buy it. This leaves the entire city teeming with mosquitoes, vulnerable to all sorts of health issues. <laughs> In the end, it's easy to focus on the problems of this place, but many of Dhaka's people are filled with hope. In a video produced by the YouTube channel Footsteps, we see there's no shortage of bright people full of ideas for how to make things better. We have problems, yeah, we have problems. We have traffic congestion, we have corruption, we have a lot of problems. We have a lot of but it's ridiculous statistics and labels as Dhaka is the second worst city to live in. Please don't buy into that. These are just people with agendas. So let's forget about all these second worst city to live in and let's just do our best to make this city the best city to live in. He's right. The people of Dhaka will decide their fate. But they need to have a real sense of urgency because the real challenge is just beginning. Climate change threatens to make their situation much worse. By 2040, it will be 2 degrees Celsius warmer, the glaciers and snowpack in the Himalayas will melt faster, and rivers flowing from the mountains in the north will meet wider deltas in the south as more intense and more frequent cyclones drop more rain on this already flood-prone land. Much of Bangladesh lies within 10 meters of sea level. That means when the sea rises in expected 2 feet in the coming years, the already overcrowded country will have 3% less land. It won't be easy to implement the changes DACA needs to see, but there are solutions to most of these challenges. Thanks for watching. I'd love to know what you think DACA and Bangladesh as a whole should prioritize in its quest to manage one of the most challenging situations any civilization has ever faced. One megacity always seems to be at the forefront of progressive movements, whether it's innovation in its cuisine, couture, infrastructure, or governance. This refuge for the rebel, artist, philosopher, and scientist has always held a place in the hearts of romantics and vanguards alike. Because here, in the City of Light, engineers and artists often share a line of sight. This is Paris, the grand megacity. 2300 years ago, a group of Celtic Gauls called the Parisi settled on the Ile de la Cité, a small island in the middle of the Seine. After falling into the hands of the Roman Empire, the town grew, until the empire collapsed a short time later. Clovis, the first king to unite all the Frankish tribes in Paris, is the origin of the name Louis, taken by 18 subsequent French monarchs. For the next thousand years, or the period known as the Middle Ages, Paris saw rulers, religions, wars, and plagues come and go as it became the largest city in Europe. Home to one of the first universities, and the birthplace of Gothic architecture, Paris was ground zero for the Enlightenment. Philosophies embracing individual liberty, religious tolerance, and the scientific method were perfectly captured by the phrase sapere aude, dare to know. In the end, the monarchy and the church were simply overmatched by the sheer power of a set of ideas whose time had come, ideas that were spread far and wide by books and pamphlets. The stage was set for revolution. On the afternoon of July 14, 1789, the Bastille, a medieval fortress and prison symbolizing royal authority in the center of Paris, was overtaken by force. It was the opening move in a ten-year struggle that featured the bloody overthrow of the monarchy, the establishment of the French Republic, and violent political turmoil. The dictatorship of Napoleon followed, delivering many principles of the revolution to much of Western Europe. By the middle of the 1800s, Paris had well over a million people, but was made up of tight streets and overpopulated, filthy alleyways. Life for many was a miserable, day-to-day -day struggle in disease-ridden slums, so Napoleon's nephew, who had become emperor himself, set out to make the city healthier, less congested, and grander. He turned to a clever man full of audacity and skill the visionary urban planner Baron Haussmann. 
He imagined the modern city as a living organism, with the boulevards its arteries. Over the next 17 years, the duo oversaw the most epic public work spree since ancient Rome. Tens of thousands of workers were hired to carry out their plans, which included completely rebuilding the sewer system and installing hundreds of kilometers of pipes inside of it to distribute gas for thousands of new streetlights, two brand new rail stations connecting Paris to the rest of France, and more than 20 parks to ensure that none was more than a 10 minutes walk away from anyone. But the innovation that most transformed the city was Haussmann's dedication to wide boulevards, 12 of which converge on the roundabout circling the Arc de Triomphe. Throughout the 30-year undertaking, hundreds of thousands of people were displaced in phases as the entire city became a construction zone. This sacrifice, which wasn't always appreciated by the residents of Paris, was well worth the end result. The discipline to keep the buildings lining these avenues the same height, all faced with similar colored stone, created a striking visual effect. Over the next 100 years, Paris was thankfully spared the widespread destruction suffered by many other capitals in the wars and conflicts that unfolded across Europe. When the unthinkable happened in 1940, and Nazi flags were raised throughout Paris during the German occupation, Hitler declared the city too beautiful to bomb. Famous photos show him posing like a tourist at the base of the Eiffel Tower, which was the tallest building in the world at the time of its construction in 1889. Originally planned to be dismantled after 20 years, converting it into a radio tower saved it, and today it is the most visited landmark on the planet. Another signature site is the Louvre. Built and expanded over the course of eight centuries, what was once the largest building in the world used to be a palace. That changed when the royals were thrown out during the French Revolution. Today it is the most visited museum in the world. As the decades after the French and Allied victory in World War II stretched into the 21st century, Paris remained at the forefront in the battle of ideas, grappling with challenges like how best to educate its students, integrate immigrants and refugees, offer services to its people, and find a balance between security and liberty in the face of terrorism. But Paris has always come through the other side of struggles more unified and stronger, just two weeks after suffering the deadliest attack on French soil since the Second World War, Paris hosted 196 countries in an effort to make progress on climate change. The French government is also focused on making sure the 12 million people who now call Paris home are well supported by world-class infrastructure. As it prepares to host the 2024 Summer Olympics, Paris is aiming to complete two mega-projects, building 12 more towers in the La Défense financial district on the westernmost end of the 10-kilometer historical axis, and expanding the Paris metro, adding four new lines and 68 stations to a system that is already the most extensive on the continent. These improvements will keep the city thriving for decades and ensure that the next generation of Parisians are positioned to lead on the challenges of the second half of the century. These seven megacities demonstrate the challenges of managing rapid growth in the modern era. But what's easier is managing the growth of your online accounts. Keeping track of the many passwords and logins you're constantly creating is easy with Dashlane. Dashlane, this video's sponsor, is the convenient and safe place for everything that matters in your digital life. Securely store your passwords and personal information to auto-log into your accounts instantly. Auto-save new accounts as you browse and make payments easily with secure one-click checkout. It works across every browser and every device. Dashlane's Identity Dashboard even gives you a complete picture of your online security, alerting you immediately if your information is compromised so you can quickly take action. And its secure VPN protects any Wi-Fi connection for worry-free browsing. Join 10 million users around the world who trust Dashlane's all-in-one service. Visit dashlane.com slash TDC today to try Dashlane Premium free for 30 days and enter the code TDC to get 10% off at checkout. I hope you enjoyed this full-length look at the megacities we've profiled so far on this channel. Make sure you subscribe to catch 